Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vincent Emanuele, and we're speaking with Stephen Hill, who is a journalist and author of several books, including Raw Deal, How the Uber Economy and Runaway Capitalism Are Screwing American Workers, Expand Social Security Now, How to Ensure Americans Get the Retirement They Deserve, and 10 Steps to Repair American Democracy. Today, we are having Stephen on the program to discuss an article he recently wrote entitled Coronified, Employers Are Now Spying on Remote Workers in Their Homes. Uh, thanks for joining us, Stephen. My pleasure. Great let's, to be here. Let's start out. You write, the future of work is here ushered in by a global pandemic. What does that future of work look like? And talk to us a little bit about how that future has been here for a little while as well. Sure. So, you know, many more workers now are working remotely and, and at home. Um, so, you know, suddenly their couches and, uh, and their uh, kitchen tables are their office. And, um, and, you know, some people are enjoying the flexibility. They enjoy not having to commute. Uh, so, you know, is there a possibility this could be, as I said in my article, workers paradise working at home? Or is it going to be more of a big brother panopticon because a lot of businesses are actually using various technologies to spy on their workers while they're at home. And uh, so the laptops that they use for work, um, you know, they're being downloaded with certain software um, and they, uh, you know, this software can do things like can track your, your keystrokes, it can track your, your mouse movements. It can use the eye on your camera to keep track of you and to see how long you're sitting in front of your desk. Some employers are actually requiring people to just get on Zoom and stay on Zoom all day long, even while even if they're not having a meeting. They just while they're working at their desk or at their, on their couch or wherever, they have to use Zoom. And so it raises um, a lot of questions now for the employer. You know, they're concerned are these are my workers working? Are they being productive? Um, you know, am I going to, are we going to lose productivity here during this, this uh, enormous experiment that we're all, all, all undergoing? Or, you know, are workers going to keep working? So, you know, you can sort of understand why they want to at least track what people are doing to some degree. But on the other hand, turning into this kind of big brother panopticon where they're not only spying on you, but they're doing it in your home. Right. And, you know, and they're not putting limits on like, when do you turn this on? When do you turn it off? And who decides? Is it the business, the, the employer, or is it the employee? Um, you know, it's a lot of people are stuck at home with their children and uh, and maybe two spouses are stuck at home both doing this. It just creates a lot of issues that need to be thought through a little bit. And, you know, they, they haven't been thought through because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so everybody's just rushing around doing what they can, they can do to, to make it work. So, but what we've seen is that, um, Companies like Hubstaff, Time Doctor, a whole bunch of them, the sales of their productivity software, which is their fancy name for just spying software, has tripled since uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic and the, the um, stay-at-home mandates have, have been put into place. So uh, latest uh, numbers we have about you know 40 to 45% of U.S. workers are now doing their jobs from home or, or remotely in one sense or another. Um, which is more than doubled than what it used to be. So uh, this is a big looming issue that really needs to be talked about and thought through and not just let the companies do what they want to do because they'll lean on the side of more surveillance rather than less. Now, some of our friends who are labor organizers are extremely concerned because this move away from a workplace makes it even more difficult to organize the workplace. Is this something that you would agree with? And, and is this something that you've sort of thought through thinking about these shifts in the way we're working right now? Yes, absolutely. There's a number of, of labor issues be, beyond the surveillance. Um, so when people are working remotely, um, they, they become part of what's called, you know, by the experts, a distributed workforce. They're spread out all over the place. And that kind of workforce is much harder to organize or do collective bargaining with, um, uh, not only because they're spread out, you're not physically in one place, but also over time, you start losing the relationships and the connections. Everyone's just these little, you know, pods, little molecules in the pods, wherever they are. And, and so the relationships that are so important for organizing a labor union starts getting lost. That's and then as you go even further down this trajectory, you know, for a lot of businesses, if they're going to have this kind of distributed workforce, distributed workers, um, it's 
at a certain point, you start realizing, you know what? Uh, I can use gig workers for this. I can use freelancers and independent contractors. I don't have to have regular employees. Um, and and because and then you start realizing as an employer, hmm, you know, if I can use a freelancer for this job, I can save about 25 to 30 percent on labor costs because you don't have to pay for health care, Social Security, injured worker, unemployment compensation, Medicare, all these safety net costs that employers typically pay at least some to some degree for their regular employees. Suddenly they don't have to do that anymore. And so it starts becoming this race to the bottom. And we're already seeing signs of that where uh, employers are starting to say like, oh, I can replace a certain number of my team over here. Um, instead of having to be regular employees, let's just have uh, hire a, 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 an independent contractor workforce for this part of what we do. And so this has the potential to really, really impact the future of work and how people work. And it makes it more difficult, say, for reforms like Medicare for All. In the past, one of the arguments we would make is that, hey, this actually benefits the employer as well. But now if the employer is in a relationship with their worker where they're just an independent contractor and that 20 or 30 percent is cut off the top to begin with, it makes it even more difficult to sort of leverage those employers to, to uh, support reforms like a Medicare for all, right? I mean, that's kind of what I'm Absolutely. thinking as you're, as you're talking about this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, if you, I mean, look, look at it this way. If you and I are both own businesses and we're in business and we're in competition against each other and I start using an independent contractor workforce where I'm saving 25 to 30% of my labor costs, that means I can lower my prices beneath yours and undercut you. So that puts pressure on you to start doing the same thing. And so this this is the the real big red flag that we're watching for to see if this is where it's going to go, if it starts increasing um, the number of of 1099 workers as it's called rather than W two wage workers. Um, that could that's going to be a big problem um, because you know I, I mean once you get into that level of things, there are. Uh, you know, online labor platforms now like TaskRabbit and um, and even more importantly, Upwork. Upwork is based in Silicon Valley. They claim they have about 10 million freelancers on their on their platform. And these aren't, um, you know, freelancers in your town or my town. These are freelancers all over the world. And you can go on there and you can see and, you know, the types of occupations that are being uh, on there from anywhere from computer programming to uh, graphic design to uh, lawyers, architects, just a huge number of occupations on these platforms looking for work. And, and you can see, you know, um, a worker in Thailand will say, hey, to, to design your logo, um, I'll take, you know, $2 an hour for that. And then, you know, someone in, in, in the U.S. is saying, well, I'd, I want to get 50 or $60 uh, an hour for, for, for doing that job. And so what you basically see is it's, it's, a, it's an online labor auction it's, and it's a race to the bottom. And so, um, you know, a lot of the jobs that people do can be done by anybody from anywhere. And as we get more and more into that type of uh, shape to the labor markets, it really has the potential to, to undermine the, not the social contract, the uh, health and, and, and safety net benefits, wages, labor and working conditions that have created the middle class in the United States in the post-World War II era. I wanted to get into a little bit about unionization and possibly a federal jobs guarantee, but first let's, I'm interested uh, if you could please talk about how these up, these outdated laws, as you mentioned in the article, facilitate this. Well, so when it comes to surveillance, for example, um, there really aren't any laws that say that this is, uh, illegal or, you know, there are any rules around it. In fact, the laws that are, are closest to this type of thing come from 1986 and they have to do with the telephone. So this is really before the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, apotheosis of the, of the of computer industry and, and the computer age. And, and of course, now we're on to social media and online labor platforms and uh, digital platforms in general. So the laws are just decades old and mo and several orders of, of technology old at this point, you know, things have moved on from the telephone a little bit here. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just incredible how far behind we are now. Some of these things, I think I, I usually advocate, I, I wouldn't wait for Washington DC to get its act together. Um, you know, you can look at some of these things at the state and even local levels 
to try and um, at least put some rules around it for for businesses that that want to come to uh, Indiana or your town to to try and do these kind of things. And just like some some of it could just be disclosure. You know, they have to at least tell their employees that they're doing it. Right. And, um, you know, let's at least start there. Can we, uh, you know, so employees can know. And, and then some of the discussions that they're having now is at least have a restriction about how many hours a day you can make your employees sit in front of a Zoom and, you know, and do and work that way. Um, so, you know, some of it is just kind of common sense. And, and I think by having conversations with people, whether it's labor unions, but also just regular people who are working at these jobs now, you know, what, what works for you? I mean, people are pretty reasonable. They understand their employer wants to have some idea of what makes sure they're doing their job. But, you know, rather than someone visually seeing you, you could just have good benchmarks about what you need to get done by, you know, is it over next week or these kind of thing. And you check in once a week to see if you've done it. There's lots of ways to do this that could actually make working remotely um, the cool thing that some people are hoping it might be. But we're nowhere near there. This might be too specific of a question, but do you maybe have an example of how this can play out in, say, a blue state? So what kind of reforms could happen or have you seen happen, say, in a blue state uh, that's passed reforms at the state level or at the municipal level? And then what would be maybe some of the challenges those of us, say, not living in a California or New York would face maybe in a state like Kentucky or Iowa or Indiana that has a uh, Republican trifecta control? Well, I mean, in terms of the surveillance that's going on, it's so new that n no state has really even tried anything like this. There's some discussions going on um, in policy circles about how do we deal with this. Um, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see why it has to be a red state, bl blue state kind of thing. I, I mean, it's, it's about wor working people. And um, there are some conservatives, for example. There's a new or uh, conservative organization. It's called American Compass started by some young conservatives who are concerned that a Trump-driven Republican Party is losing its connection to much of the working class because, you know, they're pursuing so many policies that are anathema to the working class. So, um, you know, I think reaching out to those sorts of groups and and uh, there's actually some uh, on, the, on the American Compass website, I think there's some innovative discussion about um, should American workers have um, what's called co-determination. Um, and for example, in Germany and in Sweden and all over Europe, um, workers in, in Fortune 500 companies, so you know, co uh, big corporations like BMW and Volkswagen and uh, Daimler and all these, the boards of directors of these corporations, 50% of the members of the board of directors are elected by the workers. And, you know, and I tell it to Americans, they can't even believe it. I, I mean, it would be as if, you know, 50% of the members of the board of directors are, are, are of Ford or GM or Microsoft or Facebook are elected by the workers that work for those businesses. And in the American view, this is inconceivable. And yet, you know, major, major countries and, and, and uh, economies are doing this. And so... Um, this group, American companies of conservatives are saying, you know, maybe this is something that we need to have to give workers a sense that they feel like they have some say in what goes on in these businesses. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, now is a time um, to not so be wedded to the flypaper of old ideas. Um, you know, I think a lot of people start to realize that a lot of what we've been doing hasn't worked in, working so well. So, yeah, 100 yeah. percent. And the reason I wanted to make that distinction, Stephen, was because there's so many sort of preemptive laws in states like Indiana that prevent us from doing things at the municipal level. So it wasn't so much about like the political composition of the different states, you know, red or blue. I know it's a working class labor issue, but it's that we have so many laws downstate in Indiana that prevent us from doing the kind of creative things at the municipal level that people can do in other states. That, that Just you. to be clear, yeah. that was why. That yeah. Was, yeah, no, no, I, I hear you. And so, you know, those preemption laws are are really tough. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's I'm not an Indiana expert at all, yeah. uh, an, an expert on Indiana at all. So, uh, you know, I'm, we'll have to brainstorm some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> now, this there also seems to be you point out in the article that there's also this there's a concern now in the midst of covid. We know that we need a testing and tracing program. But there's also a concern that you raise within the article that some of the surveillance technology being used um, 
can be intrusive in terms of our, our public health policy and our own public health records. Can you talk a little bit about this and how we might balance this as we move further and further into the pandemic, knowing that we actually need more sort of centralized logistical planning to deal with it? Sure. I mean, as you can imagine, an employer, a responsible employer has um, a, a duty to make sure that their their workers are healthy and, and they're, they're not coming and, and infecting other people in the, during this time of this terrible pandemic. So, you know, some employers, especially big employers, um, are starting to uh, require, you know, spot checks and, and um, health checks and temperature checks and all these sorts of things. And, you know, for the most part, it's, it's, it's an okay thing, but again, it raises the question of who's deciding this? Um, is it the employer? Are they doing it in conversation with the workers to make sure the workers have input? Are there any laws around this? No, there really aren't. And so, um, you know, it, it does raise the possibility to use the justification of the pandemic to engage in a whole bunch of surveillance that is even beyond the needs for health. Um, and so that's what, uh, you know, one of the things I wrote about in the article is just another red flag, like, okay, they have a, they have a legitimate need here, but, you know, we, let's have a d discussion about what, what the need is and what will meet that need and, and what's, you know, going too far um, in terms of requiring um, employees to, uh, you know, to engage in certain activities or uh, to, you know, especially if they're working remotely and they're coming in every now and then for meetings, um, you know, w do they need to have software downloaded to their smartphones, for example, to track them wherever they go, which is what some uh, businesses are requiring. So they're basically monitoring their whereabouts wherever they go. Uh, and of course, Facebook and Google and, and all these apps already do that. <laughs> so, and uh, that, that's the, a lot of people have said that that's not a good thing and we're, we're becoming this surveillance society. So do we want the businesses to have the ability to do that as well? Um, that's what I think we really need to start thinking about. Does this also get to like a sort of neoliberal context where the state sort of passes off some of those responsibilities onto corporate entities? In other words, it seems to me it would make more sense for states at the, at the state level or the larger federal state to be taking the lead on testing and tracing. Yeah, it makes sense for, for, but you know, I mean, look, the, the federal response has been nothing short of pathetic. And so, I mean, just even comparing it to responses in other countries that we see. Uh, and so in that void, um, you know, states and local governments are filling it a little bit, but now employees are just stepping up and doing whatever they want. I mean, it's just this kind of um, time that we're going through right now where, uh, you know, some have called it uh, disaster capitalism, where, um, you know, people are using a crisis to start doing things that they previously would not have done. Right. And, 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 and once that snowballs, it gets to a point where enforcement becomes really hard because it's just so many people who are either breaking the rules or just narrowly skirting the rules and, and, um, that you, you know, you don't have enough enforcers out there to do it. So this is kind of the time that we're in right now. How much this moves beyond the article and more to this bigger uh, question about gig workers. Do you, I mean, how much of this as a, as a response do you think should be like an effort towards unionization for these gig workers? Is that a realistic option? And what do you think about that just generally as a political approach? Yeah, I think that, you know, every worker should have the right to join a labor union if they if they want to. Um, you know, that's just, uh, it's sort of, if you review the history of labor law in the United States and where this whole concept of gig workers and temp workers and has come from, um, you, you know, it started in the 1950s where um, uh, businesses started hiring, uh, they, they were called Kelly girls. They started hiring women and they, they actually used the excuse of saying like, oh, we're just hiring women, you know, for just a few hours. It's just so they can make some extra money for their households. It's not a big deal. We don't need to have them comply with all the labor laws. It's just, it's just women. You know, they basically use this kind of sexist argument to, to introduce the idea of temp workers. And then that was kind of the camel's nose under the tent. 
And over the ensuing decades, they started building that out more and more, creating these classifications of workers, temp workers, uh, independent contractors that are doing more and more work. And so now we're at a point where you have independent contractors working for big companies. And, you know, you and I could be doing the exact same job for a company like Comcast, um, you know, installing cable in you know, people's homes. And you work for Comcast and I happen to work for uh, a contractor and you're getting twice the wage that I'm getting, you're getting health care and benefits and all these sorts of things, and I'm getting none of that. I'm just, uh, you know, a worker on my own. And and so this is what has crept into um, the, the U.S. economy, U.S. labor markets. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes in Germany, they actually had a, have a term for it, which I like. It's called bogus self-employment <laughs> because it looks like it's self-employment, you know, and, and of course, Uber and Lyft have taken this to the, to the umpteenth level, uh, you know, uh, bogus self-employment on, on, on steroids. I, I mean, I remember when Uber first got started, they were, they were saying our drivers are the CEOs of their own driving businesses, you know, yeah. and they were actually advertising that drivers were making like a hundred thousand dollars a year and just all this, you know, hype and, and just ridiculous um, exaggeration, none of which turned out to be true. <clears throat> just to, you know, again, get that camel's nose under the tent, breaking laws, breaking rules, pushing the boundaries of existing laws. And and so these these kind of gig workers now are, you know, come along in this in this tradition that we have now of going back to the 1950s, as they said, of temp workers and and um and you know part-time work and now gig work, in which these workers are not covered by any kind of safety net. They don't have protections of labor laws. They're not even allowed to join a labor union because that's considered collusion. You know, if you and I are in business as our own um, CEOs of our own driving business, if we try to create a, a, a labor union, that's collusion because we're colluding to fix the prices. I mean, again, it's another example of how the laws from decades ago that are being used to justify these ridiculous things are just completely out of date. The idea that Two, uh, two Uber drivers are colluding to fix prices because they want to have a labor union is, is absurd. So, and I should say that in California right now, we have passed a law, AB5, that um, that that has, uh, create, has, has said that these drivers are employees as well as other types of independent contractors. But Uber and Lyft, uh, this law went into, into effect in January 1st of this year. Uber and Lyft have completely flouted the law. They haven't implemented it. Instead, they've gone out and spent $190 million and counting on a ballot measure to overturn this law. So they, they don't spend the money on their drivers. They spend it on a, on a hundred and nine, it'll, it'll hit $200 million by this is the time this is over um, to, to overturn this law. This is the type of company that we are dealing with. And so this is the types of businesses that are, are taking advantage in every way they can of these independent contractors exploiting the heck out of them and just using them to sh take all the risk of a business and put it on the backs of those workers, make them shoulder the risk while the business is just raking the profits. That's what's going on. And I can only imagine the people who are disproportionately being screwed around by this are women, people of color and immigrants. Yes, absolutely. I mean, not only, I mean, you know, when you look at Lyft drivers and Uber drivers, there's a lot who are, you know, white guys who, I mean, keep in mind, these companies grew after the 2008 collapse. Right. And in that collapse, um, we, we saw what happened to the labor market. So basically a lot of well-paying full-time uh, jobs that had health care and safety net, those are the jobs that got cut. And they got replaced by a lot of part-time jobs and temp jobs and gig, gig jobs. That's what's happened to the labor markets. And so a lot of people who are taking these jobs, it's just like the labor market doesn't offer anything better these days. And they're taking what they can um, to try and make it make a, a, you know, a go of it in their life. Two last questions for you, Stephen, and right to your point about the labor market. Do you think a federal jobs guarantee would loosen things up for people? At least give that. And in, in other words, I know that this isn't a reality in the short term, but is this something we should be pushing towards? Well, um, I mean, I don't know how a federal jobs guarantee would work. Uh, it it depends. I, I, if, if it means that the the government then would step in as employer, then yes, that could yep. work. Yep. I mean, the, that's, the, that's the what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The government has certainly t played this role in the past and, and it could again. Um, you know, it's uh, I mean, the other things that we could do is because, it, you know, the, the labor markets have changed and, and uh, many workers now do 
make their living from working for a number of different businesses. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and, and the, the safety net that we've created um, is not geared for this type of worker. So I think at the federal level, we also need to pass a law creating a portable safety net where every worker who works for a business, that business would contribute a certain amount of money um, into a, uh, an independent uh, individual security account for that worker that they could then use to purchase their social security and Medicare and healthcare and injured worker unemployment compensation. And, and, and so every business would pay a prorated amount. So if, if a worker works for you for 10 hours a week, you'd pay, you know, like a, a 10 out of 40 hours, like a quarter of what a safety net would, would be for that, for a full-time worker. And if, if they work five hours, 15 hours, 20 hours, wouldn't matter. You, that employer would contribute a prorated amount into that worker's individual security account. So that worker and their family could have the security that they need in order to, to, to go forward and work. So that, that would be a big, um, a, a big uh, plus. We also need to change the laws that allow labor unions to organize so we can do more of what's called sectoral bargaining. So bargaining by industries rather than business by business and company by company. Uh, we have enough experience with, um, with that to know that it has a lot of downsides by doing it business by business. Um, it, it, it's sometimes called enter, enter, um, ent enterprise um, uh, 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 organizing. So the sectoral organizing would be much better for the, doing it by entire industry. So there's a number of things that that we can do that would be much better than what we're doing now. To ask you just really quick about Medicare for all, sure. do you think that this is an important one? And do you think, did you not mention it because you don't find it to be the most important reform we can make or because it's not on the table in a realistic political way right now? Because it seems also to me that if employees were allowed to leave their job without thinking that they were going to, you know, lose their health insurance, it would be again, much better for workers. Absolutely. We should have universal health care in the United States. Um, every other established uh, economy, democracy has it. And as you say, it would increase workers' power because workers wouldn't feel like they're locked into a particular job because it happens to have health care and they need it for themselves and their family. The one uh, addition I would make to that is that um, there are actually other ways to get there than what's typically called Medicare for all. And so, um, you know, in the U.S., the debate has unfortunately ground down into it's either the terrible system we have now, this for-profit system, or Medicare for all, um, and, you know, which is sometimes called single payer. But if you look around the world, you can actually see there's a third way of healthcare. So when you look at countries like Germany, France, Belgium, Switzerland, they don't have Medicare for all. Um, they have a third a type of healthcare, in which I would basically call nonprofit healthcare. So, and the way it works is like in Germany, the backbone of the German healthcare system are private insurance companies, okay? Um, just like we have in the United States, except one key difference, they're all nonprofits. And when you look at the, the difference between these, you actually see that the, it's not really matter whether you have Medicare for all single payer, it's whether your system is a for-profit system or a nonprofit system. And if it's a nonprofit system, there's different ways to do it. One is the Medicare for all uh, single payer, kind of like what they have in the UK. Um, but I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Europe and interviewing a lot of people in these different countries and including Americans who, who have been working there for years and have worked in a number of different countries. So they've been able to, to, to be consumers of healthcare in a number of different countries. And um, the, the, the countries that stand out as the best healthcare that they've had the, from people I've talked to is Belgium and France. And France actually was selected by the number one healthcare system in the world by the World Health Organization a few years ago. And they don't have Medicare for all. They have, again, these, these nonprofit, private insurance uh, companies are called sickness insurance funds. And because it's nonprofit, you, you don't have companies gouging, uh, you know, healthcare consumers. And I mean, some of the same uh, manufacturers who manufacture the same pill in France, it sells for like a fifth of what it sells in the United States. And, and, and so, I mean, we could have a longer conversation about that sometime, but I just think that, you know, for those of us here in the U.S., just realize there's different ways to do this and, and, and actually by re retaining these, these uh, private insurance companies, it would be less of a big change than what we, than going to, to a, you know, a single payer, um, more government involved uh, system. 
and it would um, as long. But the key is again, they have to be nonprofits. And when you have nonprofits, you take that the for-profit motive out of it. It means that you get more transparency in your system too, because like for example, you can go into a French uh, health, uh, doctor's office, and they have what's called the menu. And the menu is like what you can get treated for there and how much it costs, you know, how much you're going to pay out of pocket, how much the, the government is paying. And so you get transparency built in. We can't get transparency built into our healthcare system. I just had to call my healthcare insurance company because they sent me something, say I owed the money and I, they didn't, I couldn't even figure out what they were billing me for. You know, it's just like the, the, or they give you a code, you give you a code and, and you're like, what's that code for? How am I supposed to know what that is? Right. I, I think one of the reasons why I, I've always found Medicare for all appealing is because as a veteran, I use the Veterans Administration hospital system. And so as, as someone who uses that system and doesn't have to pay any co-payments uh, in the position that I'm in, um, it's really nice, you know, to show up with your card and just get treated. And, and I've heard people sort of make that distinction as well, that it's not just the system we have or Medicare for all, that there are other options it would be really interesting maybe to have you on in the future with somebody, um, you know, not to argue, but to have a real conversation about like, what are those differences and what is more reasonable to do in the United States over the short term? I mean, I think a lot of us are like, even if that's the goal, uh, as someday in the meantime, you know, we need, we need to help people. I mean, people are hurting right now. So what could we right. do right now they that would healthcare. make a difference? Yeah. And, and just to be clear, I'm not opposed to Medicare for all at all. Um, it's just that we've been talking about it, in, you know, in my lifetime for, for a long, many years. And I mean, we came really close with Obamacare. At one point, they were going to lower Medicare eligibility to 55. That would have been amazing if they could have. And they almost came close to getting the votes for that. But it just at the end of the day, it didn't happen. So, and, you know, what we got with Obamacare was a half a loaf. It did get more people on the health care rolls. And that was important. But it didn't attack the cost. And so, I mean, here's the thing is I think we can, in a, in a state like Indiana, I don't see why we can't get more conservatives on board because the U.S. is paying twice as much money per capita for health care as France and Germany and the U.K. and Sweden and uh, Canada or any of these countries. We're paying way more and all the metrics show we are getting less for our, our, yeah. our buck. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, if conservatives used to be about efficiency and, you know, being conscious about how our taxes are used, well, we have a system now that is the worst in the world among established uh, advanced countries for healthcare. And so, you know, to me, I'm agnostic on how we do it. I just want us to explore the options that are out there and the German system, which I've used and uh, I have friends that have, uh, I mean, in France, for example, uh, they still do house calls. Right. Uh, a, a right. friend of mine who lives in South, South Southern France, she, she got stung really bad by a hornet. And it was really painful. And she thought, oh, maybe I'm allergic. I don't even know what I'll call it. My doctor, you know, find out what, it, you know, what I should do. He calls her, she calls her doctor and doc says, oh, no problem. I'll be right over for, for a hornet sting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, in, in, in the United oh. States, uh, house calls for do by doctors went out when you know Ozzy and Harriet was on was a sitcom right. <laughs> in the United States. So I mean, this is the this the huge gap between reality of, of in people's lives and and how our system is responding. This is why people are voting for Donald Trump, in my view, is the you know our, our system hasn't as quit responding and and, and taking care of people's needs. Yep. And so, you know, I think we need to think big. Why shouldn't we have doctors making house calls anymore. Why can't we have a system like that if they can have that in France? Yeah. And they're spending less money. It's not about the money. They're spending less money than us. Right. So, No, and yeah. I, I mean, from uh, speaking to you from the belly of uh, what is often referred to as Trump country, most of the guests that we have on the program, we make a very simple point that if you want to start bringing conservatives over to our side, talk about these issues in a nonpartisan way. The opinion polls show that on many issues, conservatives are with us. Medicare for all, not overwhelming majorities, but a decent number. Uh, same with demilitarization, you know, cutting the defense budget. I mean, there's a lot of issues where there's some overlap if it's framed in nonpartisan ways. I mean, here's another one, um, child care. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Americans are paying the average um, American that needs child care is paying, you know, about $12,000 per year for, for two children for, for child care. You know, places like France and Sweden, it's practically free. You know, and um, and, it, and and you know, and it's not just free, but like you bring your child to child to child care, you know, when you're all going off to work, and they provide lunch for them. Right. You know, so the quality is better. It's it's less expensive for the consumer, 
and the and on on average you're spending less money um, for that health that child care system than we are here in the United States. So again, here's an example where this is not about socialism. This is not about this is about capitalism. And like, do working people have the support they need? To, to, to work and to be to live their lives. Uh, so child care is another one. University education. We're, American students are, are graduating with huge amounts of debt. That doesn't happen in many other, most other countries around the world. Um, you know, there's just so many examples like this where the U.S. is the outlier. And it seems to me that this is a message that conservatives should be on top of because it's not about big government, little government, it's about efficiency. Do we have a system that is using our tax dollars wisely, right? And, uh, and are we getting what we, what we want uh, from that system? And, and I would uh, submit that, no, we're not. And, and, and you know, Americans say, well, we don't pay as much as taxes in some of these other places. But actually, that's not true either, because we just look at what we pay in taxes. But if you're someone who's paying more for childcare, you're paying more for healthcare. You're paying more for university education. What you figure out is you're paying a lot more out of pocket to get what these other countries are getting for their taxes. And so when you add up what you're paying for your taxes and out of pocket, you're paying just as much as they are. You're just getting a lot less for your money. Yeah. You're getting a worse you know? product. It's amazing. Um, last last question for you, Stephen. It's a, a little different than the political questions I had, but I, I feel like there's a sort of a cultural or ideological component to this as well. This sort of lauding of people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, there seems to, it seems one of the cultural challenges or ideological challenges in the U.S. is to sort of dampen down this sort of cult of entrepreneurship. Not that there's anything wrong with being an entrepreneur, but that we've sort of put these people on a pedestal and have lauded people who treat their workers like crap. Um, and it seems like this is a big issue. I mean, we know working class people who would otherwise maybe be inclined to participate in more working class, class-based politics who step out and say, you know what, I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to make it on my own, whatever it may be. It seems that that's also a challenge, though less clear that there's a policy that can fix that. That just seems something that we have to deal with culturally. Well, I mean, there is a policy that can fix it. It's, it's anti-monopoly. I mean, these, these a lot of these companies now have become monopolies, and, and there's all sorts of data out there showing that there are fewer small businesses being started now than there was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And and it's because, um, you know, the, the, the digital um, platform companies coming out of Silicon Valley, they created a monopoly in the narrow area in which they started, but now they're branching out into other areas and just creating monopoly after monopoly. And, and in the process of doing that, they're reducing competition, which conservatives are supposed to be for. They're um, reducing innovation and they're killing startups and they're, and they're killing um, sm uh, small business creation. So, um, I mean, it's ironic, you know, again, going back to the Europe versus U.S. comparison, but a place like France, which is seen as like stifled in, 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 you know, socialist bureaucracy, there are more small businesses creating more jobs in France than in the United States. And, and say, you know, and so um, this is, you know, there's so many myths around what Americans believe about all these things. And that in some ways is the first thing we have to address and just keep hitting on it and hammering on it that no, it, this is not how it works. You know, um, I mean, you know, Going back you know, during Obamacare, some of the, the protests where they, you know, people holding signs saying, Getting, get the government out of my Medicare, right? Yeah. I mean, people have got to, you know, and, and shows like yours and, you know, books that I write and articles that I write, that's part of what we need to just keep doing is hammering away at these myths so that Americans understand, look, it's, we all, all of us uh, are presented with the same risks and the same pressures about, you know, working, living, uh, staying healthy, taking care of our families, taking care of our communities. We all face the same risks. So we might as well try to work together to adjust, to uh, address these risks in a way that is cost effective and that is uh, su successful. And when you look at it from that standard, the U.S. is is really not doing so well. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's, you know, we can keep scoring points, I think, by helping people to see that, there is a better way to do a healthcare system. There is a better way to do childcare. And, uh, you know, we can make university education low cost, if not free. Um, and, uh, you know, many, many other housing, you know, social housing, which they, 
they they use in 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 many places um, in other parts of the world uh, is is all things that we can do that would would make it better. Fortunately, on the ground, from our perspective, all I can say is that you know the the polls are moving more in our direction, and I think the debate around the current stimulus plan is a direct reflection of that. Trump, to some degree whatever you want to say about him, ran on this platform in 2015 and 2016 that did promote government intervention, that did promote big state programs like infrastructure. And you see it with the stimulus bill. I mean, what we find interesting is that if you talk with working class conservatives or Republicans, however you want to put that, that they actually want stimulus checks, that they want more government intervention, and that the disconnect between the Republicans and elite positions of power and their actual base becomes more profound with each day. So I, in that way, as an organizer, we look at it and say, hey, the ground is fertile for some real organizing efforts here around these type of uh, government programs because there's not as much of an aversion to it than I think a lot of liberals, progressives, and leftists think there is, you know, looking at, say, maybe what mainstream or corporate Republicans say about it. Absolutely. I, I mean, another example is uh, I wrote a book called Expand Social Security Now, um, in which I, I put forward a concrete proposal for how we could double the social security payout and how we could pay for that. Um, because, you know, the reality is, is um, the social security payout is declining as because it's not keeping up um, with the cost of living. And, um, and you know, if you compare it to other countries, it's, it's, it's only about half of what other countries get. Instead, we're expected again, you know, you talk about what you get for your taxes and what you're paying out of pocket. We're expected to save a lot more out of pocket. And, um, just by closing a lot of tax loopholes that hedge fund managers get and Wall Street bankers get and all these other types of um, loopholes, and then just making Social Security so that it's indexed so that everybody pays. Uh, right now, the way it works is that uh, you only pay um, into it up to $120,000 of your income. And so after $120,000, so someone who's paying Five hundred thousand dollars for who's who's earning five hundred thousand dollars a year. They actually pay a lower percentage of their income into Social Security than the, a, a minimum wage worker. Oh. And so, just by you know, and, and not, Medicare doesn't work that way. No, no other government government program works this way. This is just how Social Security was created decades ago. So if we just ch- cut out that loophole right there we would be able to fund a, a, a sizable expansion in the social security payout so that working people when they retire can expect to have a decent retirement and not suffer a drastic loss in um, in their retirement income. Um, instead, you have people talking about actually cutting social security. Well, that, that would be foolish because we know who gets social security. You know, 50% of Americans substantially depend on social security for their retirement. If they were to cut social security, not only would it be bad for those Americans who are substantially depending on it, but those, those retirees spend that money. So that money is what drives businesses. Businesses have them as customers. It's part of the multiplier effect. You know, my spending is your income. So if, if they cut the spe- the social security, it's just going to create a downward spiral of consumer aggregate uh, spending declining that's just going to hurt all these businesses. So it, in so many ways, it makes absolutely no sense. It makes much more sense to look for ways to expand Social Security. And it's it's eminently doable if we just cut out a lot of the loopholes that favor the wealth the, the wealthy 1% in this, in this country. Well, now my only question is how the hell we can get you to be one of the advisors to the Biden campaign. But we'll talk about that a different day. <laughs> no, Stephen, thank you so much for your time and thank you for the pleasure. astute analysis. We appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. And thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, the type of stuff that you guys are doing there is so essential. and needs to go on in every community. So thank you for your, what you're doing. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Absolutely. All right. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host today, Vincent Emanuele, and we'll talk soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.